Hola, hello. Um, I'm going to do my talk in English today. Uh, can I just get some confirmation that you can hear me? Some written confirmation, please. Hi there. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with you guys, and I'm going to be talking to you today a bit about effective altruism. And the name I gave this talk is uh, Why Being Nice is Not Good Enough. Um, one second, I'm going to share my entire screen here. Okay, so um, let's go, go to the first slide and let's get going. Thank you for having me, first of all. Um, as I said, my talk is uh, why being a nice person is not good enough. And the first thing I want to talk about is basically how amazing life is, right? We live in this multi-sensorial uh, miracle. Uh, full of amazing things to to feel and to and to live through But unfortunately, this is something that not everyone has the time to engage in So I'm going to talk about an example of someone like that um, Amit so Amit let's imagine he's a homeless person in India and he has no water no food no shelter and no health care and so naturally we can expect that she, he has no space in his mind to think about anything else, right? This is all he can think about. And one of the things that I was thinking about a few years ago was how money does have an effect on our happiness. So if anyone ever tells you money has no effect on your happiness, it's probably because they're thinking about a specific first world scenario. Because when you have no water, no food, no shelter, and uh, no health care, for instance, then money will have a big effect on your life, right? Um, as you can see in this graph where, where money is the x-axis, y is the effect on happiness. Um, happiness is affected by money when you're talking about these basic, almost biological needs. And then once you've got those settled uh, from there to a private jet, um, the things which have a bigger effect on your happiness are no longer money. There are other things. And yet it seems that most people I know are investing their time in precisely that small difference between basic biological needs and having a private jet. And so why are we talk about this? Now we've now that we've met Amit, let's look at Adam. So Adam has is like us, right? He has water on demand, lots of food, a nice bedroom, and access to healthcare. And so I tried to summarize all of this by Googling house, uh, water and food. And Quite perfectly, I might say, this doghouse showed up. And a dog is almost like a perfect example of how once you have these basic needs sorted out, you have everything to to be happy and to and to at least be grateful for, for life. And so what is Adam gonna think about, right? He he he'll try to maintain this. He might even have a family and or some friends, some some love, some belonging. So he has all these basic needs worked out. And he will, he will think about maintaining this a bit. But then he has this terrible thing, right? Death. And boy, is he in trouble, right? He's going to start, because he's different from the dog, he has consciousness, he's going to die. So he's going to do a lot of strange things, which only humans do. One of them is anchoring. So he's going to try and, in a sense, um, try and eternalize himself, anchor himself to this world through, through physical goods. Um, he'll finally have time to look at flowers because he has spare time. And when I say look at flowers, I say anything which is enjoying the present moment. And he will know how important it is to enjoy the present moment because he knows he's going to die. And finally, he'll have some space to think about Amit, which is poverty. He represents poverty. And so amidst all these things, um, this is probably going to become what I call a nice person. Because thankfully, more and more, I think, uh, as a species, people are starting to understand that this pursuit of, of material wealth um, is not, perhaps I should say, the ideal path to, to peace and happiness. So this is kind of dying out, and it leads people more focused on living in the present moment, which is the flower, 
and maybe helping other people and trying to find meaning in life. And so the circle of empathy of this person, which is all of us, grows, right? It becomes as big as the world. And this is like most first world people I know. And what we create is basically what I call a good person or a nice person. Someone who says he wants to make the world better. And what I'm here to tell you today is that this is not enough. I wish it were enough, but unfortunately it's not. And so one of the reasons that I think it's, it's, um, it's worrying that the world is quite worrying now is that there are, I think the, because of education and, 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 and lots because of the internet, there is a higher and higher percentage of good people, so people who want to make the world better, but the growth of critical thinking is falling behind. And this big gap between good people and critical thinkers uh, is something which has the potential to, um, to be dangerous even. And um, so I'm going to give some examples about that, which is passive selection of causes. So most people who want to make the world better, they, they, they have a passive selection, meaning that they embrace the causes which appear in their lives. So they don't search for it. And this could be anything. It could be something like the world would be better with only members of the Aryan race, which, of course, you know, ended in millions dying in concentration camps. It could be the world would be better if everything belonged to the state, which ended in a lot of uh, gulags and millions of other killed and persecuted by communism. It could be the world would be better if every piece of colonial art and architecture were destroyed. Or it could be something like the world will become better if you share the hashtag Je suis Charlie on Facebook. Now, without, without getting too political here, it's really important for us to, to sometimes realize that not every single Nazi was an evil person who wanted to destroy mankind and who wanted to destroy the world. We have to have the, the mental flexibility to understand that the, a lot of these people believed they were doing the right thing and that they were making the world better. And the same goes for, for communism. The same goes for destroying everything related to colonialism. And the same goes to everyone who defended Je suis Charlie, which is, it's quite funny, I was thinking about this just the other day, which is, it was to me a, a very clear example of passive selection of causes. And it was something, it was a defense of a, of a magazine or a, a journal, let's say, which created highly offensive, uh, like highly racist uh, cartoons and comments. And it's, it's interesting to see how more recently, the passive selection of causes have, have led people to defend the opposite, which is um, inclusion and, and, and so on and, and racial care. Uh, these are all good things, of course, defending freedom of speech and, of course, defending the end of racism. However, it's, it's still passive selection of causes. So it's still nice people choosing their cause through availability. And here's another example. Let's imagine someone like our, our, our character here, Adam. He's a nice person. He's passionate about slavery. And there's two things, like two interventions he can make. One is destroy a statue in his hometown, which is a statue of someone who maybe owned slaves. And that will cost him about $50 and two hours of his time. Or with the same $50, he can make a donation and write an article towards brick killing slavery research. This is a really cool project. It's just an example. It doesn't have to be exactly this, but it's a really cool project of uh, ending contemporary slavery in India. So this group in the University of Nottingham identified almost like an architectural pattern of uh, what uh, these brick factories with slaves looked like. And so they're running this algorithm on Google Maps and other satellite images, and they have successfully found contemporary slaves, child slaves working in these in these factories. And yet, as you notice by the speech bubble on the left, um, Adam was, was uh, what was available to Adam, let's say. The intervention which was most easily available to him was to destroy a statue. And so his passion about slavery became destruction, when perhaps if he'd done a bit of research on slavery, he could have found an, uh, an intervention with, with a higher impact on 
slavery which is happening today. And so moving on a, bit, a little bit now onto effective altruism. Um, I'm on, from now on, I'm only going to talk about how people can choose causes uh, to which to donate money. So I'm going to leave out time, which is a whole other issue. Um, just very quickly, I, a rule of thumb, which, which I usually use, is um, give money where it will have the highest impact and give time to your community. Um, but here we're just going to focus on, on, um, on where to donate money. So one answer, to, uh, one answer to this question is, okay, be generous, give from the heart. And I'm going to show you guys why that might not be a complete answer. So what is this? This is a play pump, and the play pump was a huge success. It was, um, it was basically, it's a, it was this a great idea, which is these these people created a pump for children to play on, and whilst they're playing, they're almost accidentally pumping water out of a reserve up to a tank and helping the village get access to water. So here's the entire scheme: the children play, they pump water up to to number four over there, and then the old people in the village can just open a tap and get uh, clean water without all the effort of, of having to pump. Um, apart from that, there would be advertising on the, on the tank, which would help pay for maintenance. It was all seemingly very well thought out, and it was very popular. It got over 20 million in funding. It won a World Bank Prize, believe it or not. And there were multiple celebrities sharing and donating and making this even much even more of a big deal. Um, there was just one problem though. This happened. And the reason this happened is because the play pump was boring. So it's that simple. So why was it boring? So I think you'll remember when you were a kid playing on these in these merry-go-rounds. Um, the whole fun of the of the whole enjoyment was in running around with your friends, then letting go, jumping onto it, and then you'd keep going in circles. But the play pump, because it was connected to a mechanism, it had no free rotation. So as soon as you stopped running, the thing would completely stop. So what was the result? No child ever played on this more than five or 10 minutes. Thousands of dollars were spent building these structures, which were used like, I don't know, I would imagine they were used like maybe 10 minutes by each child in the village. And then all this money and all this goodwill and all this potential was, was wasted. And in some places in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, you can still find these play pump structures abandoned. And so this is a great answer of why you should also give with the mind. And this is why I've added a sword here to Adam. And this is the sword of truth, if you want. It could or I could have used the brain, but I like the sword of truth because the sword of truth helps defend you from people who are trying to manipulate your good heart um, to make them do what they want you to do. So it's protecting you and it's keeping you true to yourself. And so the I think the main point of why being good is not uh, why being good or being nice is not good enough has been made. Um, but this all has a name, it's effective altruism. And it's something I've been involved with for about five years now. And then what it is, is a philosophy and social movement which applies evidence and reason to find the most cost-effective ways of improving the world. So how can I do the most good possible with the resources at hand is the best translation at it. So basically, how can I use my good heart and my goodwill to have the most Im positive impact on other people in the world. And these two guys, um, I can't remember their names now, unfortunately, but they had the same idea. They, they were asking each other these questions and they decided to create GiveWell. And so what GiveWell is, is a charity researcher within the philosophy of effective altruism. And basically they review thousands of charities and they choose the absolute best ones which have the highest impact. So what are their criteria? They need evidence that there's a, there's a problem happening, of course. Effectiveness in solving that problem, so how much it costs to solve that, that specific problem of which there's evidence. Um, the organizations have to be underfunded because even, you're, even though you're really like, good at showing evidence and effectiveness, if you, don't, if you don't have any way to spend the extra dollar, then there's no need for extra funding. 
And then finally, transparency. And like regarding transparency, it's 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 something that in my in my own nonprofit, Kolkata Relief, I've been I've tried to apply really well, which is being radically transparent, like to the point of every single cent being accounted for. Um, whenever you make a mistake, you publish that mistake and you show, you explain your community how you're going to improve. And it's quite liberating, actually. Like as now speaking as someone who has an NGO, it's quite liberating to to be transparent in the sense that there's nothing to hide and and every single cent is accounted for. And of course, donors love that. So, what are some examples of these of these like high impact interventions? Well, with 50 euros, you can give. On average, one year of healthy life through the Against Malaria Foundation by buying something as simple as mosquito nets. Or through evidence action, you can deworm 100 children. So now that these, these guys have gotten the, the cost of deworming a child down to 50 cents, uh, 50 euro cents. So you can deworm 100 children uh, for just 50 euros. So these are like really high impact uh, interventions. And um, and that's what effective altruism is all about. It's about prioritizing interventions and uh, joining heart and mind. Finally, there's a, a fourth ingredient which is very important, which is commitment. So now that you have your 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 circle of empathy expanded and you're worried about the world, and now that you have the sword of truth to help you choose the right uh, the right interventions and the right causes. There's a final step, which is commitment. And commitment is very important because we're all super busy, you know, like we're all rushing around and one day we see a video of a child starving and we donate 50 euros and then we forget about it. And the thing is, perhaps instead of having donated 50 euros once, if you'd committed to, let's say, donate the same you spend on Netflix and Spotify per month, so let's say about 15 euros, um, if you'd committed to give 15 euros per month, um, at the end of the year, that's uh, a lot more than having just given 50 euros once. And so becoming a, a monthly donor and, and committing is, is very important. And it, it always has a much higher impact than single donations because it allows nonprofits to know what they're counting on and hire new people and so on and so forth. Um, effective altruism is is a very rapidly growing community, and and personally, it's been really really fun for me and interesting to to meet uh, personally and online a lot of people from from this community, and um, it's um, it's something that I think has space for disagreement. So I I disagree with plenty of of things in in effective altruism, um, but not with the essence, not with the core. And um, and it's really nice that there's space for that and there's space for multiple inter interpretations, um, notwithstanding that everyone wants to maximize impact. Finally, as a final note, um, I want to go back to the death thing, the deathbed. Um, and I want you to make the, the exercise of being in your deathbed and comparing the thought of, I sure died with a lot of money, or I help thousands of people. And I think most people would prefer to, to feel that they helped thousands of people on their deathbed than, than knowing that they had 50 boats or something. Um, so it's just a final call to action to make your life meaningful, I guess. Thank you very much uh, and time for your questions. Um, can every, can you still hear me? All right, I'm um, trying to check out if there are any questions here um, in the live comments now.
All right. I don't know if it's. Um, I don't know if I'm being a turnip to use a Portuguese expression, but uh, I don't seem to find any questions. Um, in that case, um, is anyone from the organization there? Um, should I sign off? Oh, here it is. All right. Um, so Heloise is asking, do you believe a person can learn to become altruistic? Hmm. I think there's there's a part of altruism which is uh, biological. So especially regarding um, people in your family. So if you imagine like the the instinct of a mother towards their child, that is a form of altruism, right? Um, but I guess your question is probably more about becoming altruistic further out in the circle of empathy. So let's say towards people from other countries. Um, I think you can learn to become altruistic, but a lot of it is also a, a consequence of gratitude, in my opinion. I think once you once you understand that, or once you make the effort to to be grateful every day, and to at least once per day look around you and 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 think that everything is fine and you don't need anything else to be happy, then I think automatically you'll start. Um, I don't know. I think automatically you'll start thinking about other problems to solve other than yourself. Um, I think traveling also helps a lot, witnessing uh, witnessing poverty firsthand. Um, and I don't think, like, over the years, I've, I think I've changed my views a bit. I, I think there is a moral obligation of those who, who have plenty to help those who have little, especially when it has no impact on their life. But at the same time, maybe I, I've come to um, to respect people's journeys more, and 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 to realize that there's there's no there's no wrong answers, right? We're all just humans trying to trying to get this level of level of existence, and no one really knows anything in the end. But but yeah, I hope I answered your question. Seems like we have a new question here. So what criteria do you personally use to make donations? Okay, so I donate a lot of my money to my own nonprofit, which is Kolkata Relief. It's www.kolkatar.org. Um, and I also donate, I used to donate 10% uh, of my income. Like back when I got involved with effective altruism, I committed to donate 10% of my income to, to give well. Um, which is uh, not give well, sorry, giving what we can, but giving what we can uh, distributed my money along the, the top four or five uh, NGOs in, in give well. Um, having said that, um, so sometimes people say, okay, but if everyone did that, if everyone was an effective altruism and donated, uh, effective altruists and donated uh, only to those four organizations, wouldn't that leave like a lot of smaller organizations which also do really good work without money? And the answer is no, because as soon as a few people started donating to, to let's say, these, these current top four or five, the next day they'd be overfunded, bam. And so like you'd go on to the next four or five, and then those would quickly become overfunded too. And so as long as you would have enough information to, to, to always prioritize uh, donations by impact, then like very quickly we'd, you know, we'd solve so many problems. Um, so yeah, my criteria, I guess, is uh, ego <laughs> because I donate to my, my own organization, which I want to thrive. And also because I think we're doing very good work. And then the, the, the rest of donations is, is give well. And I also think it's important to donate locally. Um, I think we all have some kind of responsibility to our to our community and and to our street and to our city and to our country. 
but I can't quite put my finger on it because in a way it's it contradicts the whole like super rational effective altruist mindset so good question thank you Right, so I'm gonna wait 30 more seconds here just to see if another question pops up. All right, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, to everyone who, who showed up thank you to thank you to campus party for the invitation i hope you enjoyed this and see you around bye